Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com runs down the major markets. He takes a look at what sky-high inflation is doing to bonds, precious metals, crude, and the Canadian dollar. He also has a special offer for our listeners. John Rubino from dollarcollapse.com discusses the trucker freedom convoy, 40-year high inflation in the U.S., gold, the outlook for the stock market, and cryptos. WolfStreet.com publisher Wolf Richter checks in from San Francisco to talk about unbelievable used vehicle prices, consumer debt, and U.S. real estate. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from American Manganese President Larry Ray. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Good to be back with you, Jim. U.S. inflation officially in the 7% range now, the highest in 40 years. What kind of an effect is that having, especially on the bond market? Well, you know, the bond market has already been in a waterfall here. It's just been uh, tanking. And the uh, the news uh, pretty much then kicks in. Um, you know, it, it's... It, it should be old news because we've we've seen what's been happening with commodity prices, uh, the agricultural side, the crude oil market. So the, the bonds have now generated what we see as uh, downside capitulation, and uh, on the Treasury uh, yields, the 10-year yield that we've been targeting up at uh, the 210 to 215 range and uh, got up to 206 at the tail end of this week. So um, I think that, uh, you know, the initial part of this bond reaction to the uh, CPI numbers is pretty much baked in. I'd expect to see, hopefully, a, uh, a big consolidation here as far as the uh, interest rates are concerned. Uh, you know, it could last the better part of a, you know, a month or two and uh, then see how it uh, looks to resolve after that. But I think the biggest part of that uh, run is behind us right now, and uh, I wouldn't be uh, um, looking to uh, trade aggressively in the direction. I think it's time to be thinking about maybe some option trades that would uh, take care of a uh, consolidation and earn some time premium over there. What's the tension between Russia and Ukraine doing to the precious metals market? Well, um, you know, uh, this one we had been, uh, you've got good strength here, in particular in the gold market. And um, we got, uh, I guess, up to 1860-ish, maybe closed a little bit below that at the end of the week. But, uh, you know, we had that good oversold reading of the simultaneous one in gold and silver. And uh, that was at the beginning, just at the end of last month. So the anticipation out of that is that you get a two to four week period of buoyancy with gold being particularly particularly strong relative to silver, and that's what we're seeing here. This is the best levels that we've seen in gold in quite a while, um, not out of the major resistance levels. You might be looking at something around 1880 as a reasonable target in here, but uh, so far uh, just working nicely off the modeling that we've got. And uh, uh, as I say, I don't want to be too aggressive on this one uh, in you know thinking that it's the big breakout. Um, this has just uh, had been a good tradable rally, and um, we're going to stick with it for a little longer. The Canadian dollar, why is it stuck in one spot when oil is so high? Uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, there's a conundrum here because uh, at a 90 to $94 oil market and good commodity prices on the grain side of things, you know, this, uh, you know, does it get down to the uh, the problems at the border? Does it get down to just the politics here in Canada? You know, it's hard to say. Even 
you know, if we take a look at the Australian dollar, um, it's not as uh, performing as poorly as the Canadian. But as a whole, these commodity currencies just don't seem to have the life that you would expect. And therefore, um, you know, I think any any uh, pullback in those commodities um, is going to have a real deterrent as far as the Canadian dollar is concerned. Now, as far as oil is going, um, you know, with the um, situation uh, and the tension between Russia and Ukraine, that uh, we'd had a, a small correction held up, held up uh, very nicely the last couple of weeks here, a little um, two to four day corrections holding well above the moving averages. Uh, and our target for this big move has been 103. We've been looking at that for the better part of a year. Uh, our initial resistance was to be uh, in the uh, $80 range, but then uh, upper target being at 103. And uh, the way this is moving right now, that looks to be uh, nicely in place. Um, and um, the typical rally out of a big cycle low that we had uh, two years ago, April of 2020, that rally typically is uh, just over two years, usually uh, two years and two months. So somewhere out into maybe April, May uh, would be an optimum time for uh, the oil market to find a high from a from a uh, cyclical and a technical point of view. So um, the you know the run has been nice, and um, you know when we look at the uh, the uh, stocks out there, the uh, the XLE and the XCG, the um, uh, oil and gas uh, ETFs are about the only indices that uh, are at new highs this week. So, uh, you know, you you go with the issues that are working. And so, you know, it's always do more of what's working and less of what's not. Ross, do you still have a special offer for our listeners? Yes, we're down to the last few days on this one. Twenty-five uh, percent off for subscribers of new annual subscriptions, and uh, if uh, they just drop by the website uh, chartsandmarkets.com, they'll find the link right there. Ross, thank you so much for being on this week in money. Always a pleasure, Jim. Coming up, John Rubino next on this week in money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble, his website, DollarCollapse.com. He's speaking to us from Port Angeles, Washington State. Welcome back to the show, John. Hey, Jim. Good to be back. Canadian truckers are making global news with their Freedom Convoy and blockades across the country and on the border. Why is the mainstream media so offended by this working-class protest? Uh, you know, it, it is kind of um, illustrating a divide. I, and, you know, I can't speak for Canadian politics at all. I can only um, talk about what I've observed in the U.S., but... Um, what we consider to be liberals now, in other words, the Hillary Clinton, um, Joe Biden branch of the Democratic Party, is really this um, corporatist political party that is made up of well-educated people who are m most comfortable around wealthy professionals. And, you know, the Democratic Party used to be the party of the working class, but in the U.S. it's morphed into, you know, this other thing. And so that's left no one to speak other than, uh, you know, a small branch of the progressives within the Democratic Party to speak for working class people. And it's got, uh, you know, high school educated white guys, let's say, um, very angry and looking for a home. That's how Donald Trump got elected. He spoke the language for the working class. Uh, and so the, um, the, the trucker protest in Canada is sort of the worst nightmare of the corporate Democrats down here because, um, the, the, you know, truckers are basically blue collar guys who work with their hands, um, or, you know, otherwise 
work within the physical world, and that's completely alien to our, in the U.S., corporate Democrat liberals. And so they're terrified of a movement made up of people like that. So down here, they're appalled by it because it strikes at the heart of their political power. Um, and, you know, I, again, I don't know how the dynamic plays out in Canada, but if you have your own version of corporate Democrats, I'm sure they're appalled for basically the same reason. Oh, yes. And uh, the federal liberal government has done absolutely nothing to either uh, ease the problem or haul the truckers out. Nothing. They just say, oh, well, please go home. And I don't know, just saying please doesn't seem to help anybody anymore, anytime. Yeah, I, I think it has to come to a head at some point where either the government gets involved and tries to break it up or they cut a deal of some sort where the government says, okay, you know what, um, 90% of you are already vaccinated. We'll let the other 10% slide. Go ahead and drive across the border. And I think that would solve it. And uh, that, that's the, um, the simplest solution is that kind of compromise. You know, but I, the U.S. Know has the, the, uh, the, the, US has the same regulation, be. though, where uh, international truckers have to be double vaccinated, so the U.S. would also have to change its rules. Canada can't well, do it by seeing, itself. We're seeing a um, incipient trucker convoy movement happen here, too, where trucks are starting to head for D.C. <laughs> so, you know, this, this thing has legs, and I, I don't, you know, I don't think it's guaranteed to work out one way or another. It's going to be very interesting from here on out. Hmm. The GoFundMe part of the trucker story is interesting. What does it mean for future funding campaigns that contributions can simply be blocked or stolen? Well, you know, this, this is sort of a branch of the social, um, social media movement here where people are already leaving to the extent that they can the, uh, the big corporate social media companies because they, um, they perceive themselves to, uh, to be censored or otherwise misused by some place like Facebook or Instagram. So they're, they're moving to, um, social media platforms where they're not censored. And I think the GoFundMe thing is just, a, you know, an offshoot of that. There are other um, funding platforms that promise not to pick and choose between who's allowed to raise money on them and then, you know, like what GoFundMe did here. They just tried to steal that money. You know, they were just going to take it and send it to charities. Um, and then some um, attorneys general in the U.S. got involved and GoFundMe changed and said, okay, well, we'll just give it back to the original donators. Um, and it, it still left a bad taste in the mouth of a lot of people. So I think there's um, th there's going to be an accelerating movement into, obviously, social media platforms and now funding platforms uh, that don't come in with an agenda, pick and choose, and... Uh, and, and in that way, censor or otherwise control the people who are using the platform. So, again, you know, very interesting time in in the system when uh, a lot of the power structure got extremely overconfident and uh, started doing the things that overconfident people do who don't feel like they uh, there can be any recourse. You know, and it turns out there is a recourse. People can leave, <laughs> and uh, and that's what's happening. So we're seeing a big power shift, and uh, and it, it'll be interesting to see how far that power shift goes. Because, you know, okay, taking one step back to the meta level here in the U.S., we're kind of um, we're kind of doing a uh, you know India after independence thing going, where you know the Indians had to decide whether they were going to live in a Muslim country, Pakistan, or a Hindu com country. India. And they went through this totally chaotic process of, you know, people from one group moving to the other group and battling it out on the way and a million people that the U.S. has something like that going on right now with people moving from blue states, that is Democrat controlled states to red states, which are Republican controlled states. And a, an awful lot of people talking about, uh, you know, various kinds of secession where part of Oregon and Washington become part of Greater Idaho, which is a state slash small country in, in the mountain states there. And, uh, you know, that again is, is just beginning. So it's got a long way to run and it's going to be very contentious, I think, before it all sorts out. Yeah. And this trucker thing too, uh, we now have French truckers flying Canadian flags and handing them out saying, uh, they're mad as hell 
about the vaccine mandates, but I think it's it's more than that. I think it really is they don't feel governments represent their interests anymore. Well, yeah. I mean, that's how we got Donald Trump down here, is that um, it was very clear that the establishment wasn't representing a huge part of the population. So when someone came along who, even though, you know, let's let's just say it, he was kind of a fraud from the point of view of a uh, an actual policy um, um, suite, but uh, he spoke the language of people who were being disenfranchised by the power structure. Uh, in, in Canada, you probably have sort of the same dynamic, maybe with different groups of people, but uh, there are people who feel left out. And they are, because of that, they're volatile. You know, they're, they're, uh, they're ready to join causes that seem to be anti-establishment. And, uh, um, you know, I, what do you think? Um, will, will Trudeau stay in power, or is this a death knell for him and his government? Well, uh, because Canada has four basic parties uh, the liberals who are very who are left the conservatives who are conservative the ndp the new democratic party which supports the minority liberal government uh, don't forget about two-thirds of canadians did not vote liberal so he doesn't have the majority support it's not like in the u.s where you have two choices either conservative or liberal uh, and uh, right, and that, that makes him fragile, right? Is it? Um, is well, he sure, he's suppo- right yeah, he's opinion? he's supported by the new Democratic Party, so uh, he'll win the votes. And the Bloc Québécois, who's uh, the fourth party, well, all they want is Quebec independence, and uh, until they get that, they just try to take as much money out of Canada as they can to stay in the country. <laughs> so it's an interesting yeah. process there. So as long as Trudeau's willing to give Quebec uh, more money than they actually need. Uh, they'll stay in Confederation. It, it's an act of bribery to keep Quebec in. So he has to kind of toe the line there as well. So you see, Canada's had a successionist movement uh, since the 60s, where Quebec had uh, the FLQ, a terrorist group, uh, killing people and kidnapping folks and so on, trying to get independence. We've had referenda on it where... Quebec narrowly voted to stay in Canada. So he's got a, a multiple thing. Uh, and also the Conservative Party is very much a Western Canada-based party. The Prairie Provinces vote Conservative for the most part. That's where the oil and gas is for the most part. And the Liberal government is against oil and gas. So there's that resentment as well. So there's a whole okay. lot more than just uh, vaccine passports at play here. Okay. Okay. Well, you know what? I'll start paying attention now. <laughs> as, as an ignorant American, I tend not to pay that much attention to the politics of other countries, but I think you guys are interesting now, so I'm going to start watching. Yes. Now, uh, yes, he he won 32.6% of the popular vote. So in the U.S., that certainly wouldn't get you to be uh, the leader of the, of the country with 32.6% of the vote, but being a parliamentary system, as long as you get one vote more in that particular riding, and it doesn't matter if the riding next to you, uh, 150,000 people voted for the guy, it still counts as one seat. So, it, like, again, Canadian politics, uh, he's ruling like he won a majority, but he didn't. Hmm. And it tells okay. you, like, two-thirds of Canadians voted for somebody else. All right. Interesting. Yeah, so we're, we're much more fractured here. Uh, but one big difference in Canada is we get the budget passed every year. Hmm. Because okay. it's a vote of confidence. If uh, Parliament votes against the budget, then the government falls. Okay. Uh, that doesn't happen in the U.S. If they don't approve the budget, then you just stumble on and have layoffs and what else, uh, you know, the government closes down and that never happens in Canada. In fact, I think Canada works best when Parliament's prorogued and no one officially is in charge <laughs> during the election campaign. Okay. The country seems to do just fine. Yeah, you guys do, you know, in general, seem like a uh, a well-managed place. But again, that's just my uh, my ignorant American uh, inattention speaking, maybe. So anyhow, speaking well, of um, ignorant Americans, should we talk about the Fed? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the yield on the 10-year 
U.S. Treasury note is now above 2%. How much higher can it go before that breaks the financial system that the Fed claims to control? Yeah, yeah. That, this got very, very interesting today because um, consumer prices reported today higher than expected in the sevens. We, we now have inflation above 7% in the U.S. And the Fed still hasn't raised interest rates, even though the past year's increase in inflation was 7%. Um, so now they're uh, all of a sudden people are starting to think, wow, is there going to be a, like an emergency rate increase? And is it going to be 50 basis points and blah, blah, blah? And like you said, the, uh, the 10 year treasury yield just popped above two, which is a, uh, you know, when, when we, when you surpass a big handle that has psychological power in markets. So we just, uh, went up into the two handle now with 10 year yields. Um, and, of course, stocks tanked on that news, and gold and silver got very volatile. They were up, and then they were down, and they're, they're down a little right now. Um, so the, um, the volatility that we've seen for the past couple of months in U.S. financial markets is liable to um, increase now because uh, we don't have a Fed meeting for another few weeks yet. But well, we've got all this speculation about what kind of crazy thing is going to happen next and whether, uh, you know, whether somebody's going to do something preemptively. And this is um, extremely dangerous. You know, your question is what interest rate on the 10-year um, Treasury note blows up the markets. And the thing is, we don't know, but we know it's closer today than it was yesterday and that it's probably lower than the last one that blew up. The markets, because uh, what we've been doing is having a series of booms and busts. There's debt soars, and then the system crashes, and you know debt soars again, and interest rates go up because inflation is going up, and then interest rates get too high and it blows up. You know that that's been happening over and over. Um, but each time with a lower interest rate, causing the, uh, the the bursting of the bubble. So I would guess that it's somewhere in the twos. You know another couple of months, like the last couple of months in Treasury bonds, in other words, another increase of 50 or 70 basis points or whatever, uh, and, you know, that could do it. We, we could be back in 2008, 2009 with huge sections of the financial market just blowing up. So, uh, you know, no guarantee that's true, but um, it has the feel of that, again, because uh, people need to remember that 2008, 2009 was a, was a horrendous market crash and recession, but we are actually in much better financial shape back then than we are now. We're in much, much more leveraged condition now than we were um, in, say, 2006, 2007, you know, heading into the Great Recession. So when things blow up now, it can be correspondingly worse in the financial markets, which is to say, you know, 70, 80, 90 percent drops in a lot of these high-priced equities now, not out of the question at all. This could be completely crazy when it happens. Meat processor Tyson Foods raised beef prices by 32% in the most recent quarter. How is that possible, and what does it mean for overall inflation? Well, it kind of means overall inflation is higher than the government is telling us, right? Because when you have big components of the cost of living rising at double-digit rates, you know, mid-double-digit rates, not just 12%, but 30-something percent for for beef and 50% for used cars, uh, you know, either you have to have a bunch of things in the economy going down in price, um, of which I'm not aware of any, <laughs> and uh, to offset these gigantic price spikes, or else the overall rate, you know, when you take the average of everything, uh, it's much higher than they're telling us. And I suspect that's the case. You know, I think if we, uh, if we included housing, which is roaring in its own right, and rents, you know, um, in five major cities in the U.S. in 2021, rents went up by more than 20%. So picture it, you know, your gasoline has doubled, your rent is up by 20%, your groceries are up by 10 or 15% if you're buying any kind of meat or anything. And how is your overall cost of living only up by 7%? It doesn't make mathematical sense. So I think that uh, part of what's roiling the markets right now is that while 7% is bad, a lot of people suspect that the real number is much, much higher. And I, I suspect that, too. You know, I think inflation is actually, uh, you know, in the low double digits. I think 12 to 15 percent is probably what we're seeing now, given houses, beef, cars, and a bunch of other things. So so we'll see. But I, I, I don't think 
something like that, when it's true, can be hidden by fake government statistics for very much longer. Well, back in the 90s, Canada and the U.S. agreed that inflation numbers would no longer include fuel, housing, or the price of taxes. So that right there <laughs> uh, knocked the, you know, the official inflation numbers down. But as John Williams uh, from uh, Real Stats will tell you, uh, inflation's been running much higher than what the government says it has been for several years. Yeah, what he does is he calculates inflation according to the way we used to do it in the 1970s, before we started all this um, statistical yeah, manipulation. The shadow stats, yeah. So he, and, and so he's coming up with numbers that are higher than what we had in the 1970s. When the 1970s was a financial crisis of epic proportions, you know, that was the uh, that was when a lot of people thought it was over for the uh, the Western economies. And that's when silver went from five bucks to fifty bucks, and when gold went from a couple of hundred dollars to eight hundred dollars, um, and lots of other things happened. And, oh, and that we had to raise interest rates to nearly twenty percent to cure that problem. And there's no way we can do that again. So if this is like the uh, the mid to late 1970s, we lack the tools that we had back then to fix things. Uh, and when the market figures that out, uh, it is over with a capital O. You know, the, the system is just going to spin out of control. What's the risk-reward calculus for the U.S. stock market? Well, uh, it to me, it seems like it's skewed. The risks are skewed towards the downside now because stocks are as richly valued as they've ever been. And that's saying something. You know, I'm including um, the 2000 or 1999 tech stock bubble, the uh, 2007 housing bubble when a lot of related stocks were through the roof. We are more overvalued that now than we were then. And those were horrendous stock market crashes. That um, you know that, that came after the bur- bursting of the bubble. So, it, you know, it's completely possible that stocks overall drop by half from here before all is said and done. Um, and it's possible that a lot of the really overinflated, like big tech stocks, for instance, uh, they they have such air pockets under them. It's easy to believe they go down by more than fifty percent. So, I would say that the um, the risks are horrendous. And the potential reward from for here from here would be basically one last melt up in a bubble market, okay? Which could be another fifty percent or so, but um, it, it's probably going to be very quick and very brief if it happens. So you need to accept the volatility on the way to that, and uh, and then hope you get out in time. Uh, but I think the um, the downside of this market is going to be a lot more protracted. So uh, I would, I, I mean, I personally am skewing towards the short side now. You know, I've got a lot of precious metals, which are a, uh, um, a hedge against extreme market volatility up to, an, up to a point. And I've got some NASDAQ short positions, which, you know, if everything else falls, those short positions will become more valuable and that will partially offset the decline in other stuff. So I'm doing that, and, uh, you know, my plan is just to keep adding to the short side from here on out um, until it breaks. And uh, so we'll see. It's a little bit of a game of chicken here. (laughs) Can the market stay irrational longer than uh, I can stay solvent or vice versa? Well, while everything else is bouncing all over the place, gold's been stable within a fairly narrow range. Why and what does this mean going forward? Well, with gold, you've got two different... um, mindsets out there. One is that, okay, you know, we're, we're heading into extreme volatility. Gold is, is, you know, is, is, is good to own during extreme volatility. So let's load up on gold. The other is, oh, and there's inflation, of course. You know, you buy gold and silver um, as an inflation hedge and inflation is rising. Therefore, precious metals are, are interesting. Uh, the other side of that argument is that, uh, you know, if stocks tank, they'll pull gold and silver down with them. So sell your gold. So you've got these two forces right now out there. Um, so you've got basically buy the dip and sell the rip in gold. And they're kind of balancing each other out. So gold has been relatively stable compared to almost anything else out there. You know, look at gold versus Bitcoin. No comparison. Gold versus tech stocks. Uh, gold versus anything. You know, it's, it's sitting there while these other things are making these huge dramatic moves. Uh, and there's a time when just sitting there is a really good characteristic for some part of your portfolio. And I think, uh, you know, gold is kind of in, in that sweet spot now psychologically where people are getting more and more worried about volatility. 
and therefore more and more interested in return of capital rather than return on capital. Uh, that doesn't mean gold and silver won't get whacked if the, uh, the stock market flash crashes, but it does mean uh, that they'll recover pretty quickly when the Fed capitulates and starts flooding the system with, with um, you know, new credit. The U.S. estimates drug overdoses now cost a trillion dollars a year. Is the U.S. becoming a third world country? Yeah, I, I run a series on dollarcollapse.com called Welcome to the Third World, which chronicles these weird things that are happening in the United States that, um, that Americans think should not happen because our birthright is to have a system that works. And in, in a lot of cases, the system isn't working anymore, and one of the big ones now is these drug overdoses. I mean, especially opioid overdoses, these are, are deaths of despair. In other words, you, you probably aren't going to get addicted to opioids unless you have either a really serious injury that, uh, uh, that causes chronic pain or your life just sucks and you just want to deaden the pain with whatever is nearby. And um, I think that's the case for a lot of people. You know, life is hard. Jobs are crappy. Uh, they don't pay enough money to, to do anything that's fun after you get home from your crappy job. Um, and that's just your life to the horizon. You know, you, you're going to do that until you drop dead. Uh, and an awful lot of people are looking at that and thinking, well, I want to just escape from this somehow. <laughs> and and so you're, you're seeing a lot of um, opioid abuse. And because opioids are extremely hard to um, to gauge when you're taking them, you know, if you're taking so what, what somebody says is fentanyl, you don't know how much you're getting or what you're really getting. And, you know, so, so, so it's very easy to overdose on that stuff. And so a lot of these deaths are accidental, but the impetus for taking the drug in the first place is that life is just not what it used to be in the U.S. You know, we need to get our act together. There's no reason that this won't accelerate from here. Well, here in British Columbia, over 2,200 people died from drug overdoses last year. And while the government runs flashy ads on TV about it, uh, I don't see what's being done to solve it. Uh, I think my mother had the right solution. Just make all the drugs legal, make sure they're pure, sell them from the local liquor store, and tax the hell out of it. That, and that squeeze uh, organized crime out of the game. Yeah, that, that would, um, you know, other countries have done that. Portugal, for instance, hmm. is um, a place where drugs are basically legal, and their drug problem is minuscule compared to a lot of other countries. We could do that. Um, it would, uh, you know, there would be short-term disruption, but in the longer run, like you said, tax it. <laughs> a lot of state and local governments are feasting on marijuana tax revenues right now. So there's no reason why we couldn't extend that to a lot of other things and then control the quality and um, and, and in that way. But, but remember, people would still take opioids if their lives suck otherwise. So you can't just legalize opioids and then expect people to stop dying as, as long as jobs don't pay much of anything and there's no real hope for the future. There's no upward mobility. You know, we've shipped all the good factory jobs to China, so um, a high school-educated 40-year-old man has basically nothing he can do that gives him the kind of status that, that a guy really needs to feel like somebody in the world. So, yeah, we, we need to um, change on a fundamental level in the U.S. for any of this stuff to get fixed long term. And I think the the trucker uh, convoys are, are part of that as well. People are just so frustrated that government doesn't seem to be doing anything about the day-to-day -day problems they face. Yes. Yeah. See, big protests like this don't just happen for no reason, especially not in the winter. What is it, like negative minus 17 degrees Fahrenheit up there now? Um, I've, I've seen that outside on the news, and and and, and yet... People are lying the streets for these truckers. The truckers are out, you know, around their trucks, standing there protesting uh, in incredibly cold weather. You don't do that unless you are deeply frustrated. It's not just one thing. As you said, 90% of truckers are, uh, are vaccinated. Uh, so it doesn't directly affect them. And yet um, their frustration is such that they're going to turn out because they want to change things, and this is their chance to change things. So... Um, I, you know, I think if we if we see the trucker protest in Canada, and again, I'm, I'm committing the, uh, uh, the the sin of pretending I know anything about what's going on in Canadian politics, but I suspect that if they 
did away with the um, the vaccine mandate for truckers immediately. That wouldn't really solve the problem because there's a lot of other underlying frustrations that would definitely have to be dealt with now that these guys have figured out that they can ask for change and get it. So I, I think that's going to be the next part of the story is the, the vaccine thing resolves itself, and yet there's still turmoil. So a lot of things have to be dealt with. Now, uh, what's going to happen with cryptocurrencies? Uh, it seems to me that uh, Bitcoin, for example, follows the S&P. When it's up, so does Bitcoin. When the S&P falls, so does Bitcoin. Uh, is that the way cryptos are going to go, or are there so many you can't predict anything? Well, okay, using Bitcoin as a proxy for cryptos. Um, Bitcoin trades like a tech stock in the sense it's a risk on asset. When people are excited and they're looking for something that's going to go up a thousand percent, Bitcoin is one of the things they grab. Uh, now, because cryptos are, are an emerging asset class, we don't know what they're going to end up being, you know, how they're, how they're going to participate and or dominate the global financial system when the time comes, uh, that they settle into their long-term role. Uh, so, that remains to be seen. Right now, they trade like tech stocks, and, and that makes them extremely risky and, you know, potentially incredibly profitable if you catch the turn in the, the next correction. Um, later on, we'll see. Um, there, there are people who um, who know so much more about this who have a much clearer idea of how Bitcoin ends up um, in a future monetary system. And um, I, I would defer to them for now and just... Uh, in the short run, treat it as any other tech stock if you're trading it, um, and then just watch what happens and see what kind of role it assumes eventually. NFTs, are they just a fad or are they going to stick around? Boy, <laughs> they have to be. You know, I, I want to say, oh, my God, they're the, you know, the, the, this craziest part of the dot-com bubble in the 1990s. That's what NFTs are. Uh, and I, I think that. But it, it could just be that... Um, I don't understand the concept well enough yet. You know, it could be that I'm a, a guy with a, a horse-drawn carriage looking at the very first car in 1905 and saying, oh, my God, that'll never become a, you know, it could be that. Uh, but I, I got to say, I think that just conceptually, NFTs make zero sense, and they're attracting money because there's too much money, you know. Zero, uh, NFTs are a um, an artifact of... 10 trillion extra dollars sloshing around in the U.S. economy and 25 or 30 trillion sloshing around in the global economy. Um, and when monetary policy tightens, which is happening right now, and a lot of those dollars are pulled out and they disappear because really all they are is just monopoly money. They're just make-believe conceptually um, things that, um, that really don't exist in the real world. When they disappear, then a lot of the also unreal things that depend on all that extra cash for their value will evaporate. I think a lot of NFTs are in that boat, but we will see. See, don't take technology advice from a finance guy. You know, I'm expressing an opinion, but not with a huge amount of knowledge behind it. Well, I look at NFTs sort of like the way sports cards were back in the 90s where the prices skyrocketed and then all the sports card shops went out of business. And now sports cards are hot again, so are painted sneakers. But I don't know if those are going to be uh, stores of value over a long term. Yeah, because think, think about this. Think about the dynamic. When, um, when you've got a lot of money, you buy lots of different things. Some of them are frivolous, some of them are serious, but you, you can do it. You can afford them all. Then when uh, you lose your job or your stocks tank or any number of other things happen to make you feel a lot less rich, you start at the periphery and sell your frivolous stuff, right? So if you've got a baseball card collection, that's the first thing that goes. If you've got an RV, even though you already live in a 4,000-square-foot house, sell the RV. So that, those things tend to collapse in value, in price. Um, when money gets tight. So th there's no reason to think that dynamic won't happen again, although RVs are a special case. I don't know if we have time to explain why <laughs> they, they aren't in that category anymore, but they always were in the past. But a lot of the other frivolous stuff is just going to vaporize. So uh, I, I think that will happen. Uh, you know, the yesterday's and today's um, bubble assets and collectibles and things will – go the way of stamps.com and pets.com and lots of other things like that. 
John, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Sure thing, Jim. Thanks. My guest has been John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble, his website, dollarcollapse.com. Our conversation took place on March 10th. Coming up, Wolf Richter, next on This Week in Money. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Wolf Richter, publisher of WolfStreet.com. He's speaking to us from San Francisco. Welcome back to This Week in Money. Thanks for having me, Jim. Wolf, used car prices appear to be on steroids. What do you see ahead for used cars? Well, this is a... uh once in a lifetime crazy situation and uh i at least in my lifetime i have never seen anything like this and and um i mean the the a three-year-old car today sells for the price of a new car and a new vehicle you know cars and trucks and and, and suvs and and it's just nuts and year over year we just got our our inflation figures you know, year over year, we're looking at 40% price increases on used cars per hour CPI. Um, I mean, it's just completely insane. But uh, the underlying dynamics have now finally started to shift. We saw the first of it in, in November a little bit and, and the more of it in December. And in January, we've got the first indication that these underlying dynamics that are weakening are coming to the surface. What happened, and that's in the wholesale market, and the wholesale market uh, determines what a month or two later happens in the retail market. And uh, uh, in the wholesale market, so these are auctions, and they're very liquid, and they're, you know, there are lots of auctions around the country, and they sell millions of vehicles a year. And uh, so this is a really good indicator of where pricing is on the wholesale level. And uh, so what we saw in November was that there was just, the pricing was still going up sharply, but there were few wholesales uh, completed. And then in December, the same thing happened, and the pricing slowed down a little bit. And then in January, we actually had the first month in, in, in many months where wholesale prices didn't actually go up at all, and that's on a seasonally adjusted basis. You know, not seasonally, seasonally adjusted, they dropped. And uh, there is a decline in retail sales now because of those high prices. People have uh, have finally pulled back a little bit, and uh, we see inventories building up. So now we have more than the average uh, supply of used vehicles on dealer lots, and there's more than average supply in the wholesale system. So it looks like. Uh, that over the next few months we will see the retail prices of used vehicles level off. I don't, you know, I don't expect them to plunge. I mean, like these lumber prices that spike and plunge, that doesn't really happen with expensive retail products such as vehicles. But uh, what we will see uh, positively, you know, we've been wrong before on this, is a leveling off of the price increases and then eventually some price declines. And uh, I don't think the prices will go back to where they were, but uh, I do see that uh, there are price declines uh, ahead of us in the used vehicle market. And what will happen is the prices will come down some, and then volume will pick up again at these lower prices. And so they'll 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 start dropping. You know, right now the economy is really strong. We don't have a situation where people are getting laid off and don't have any money and can't buy used vehicles. So that's not the case. What we've got is a strong economy, a strong demand, and people are just now pulling back from these ridiculous prices. So as soon as they come down some, uh, you know, th- th- there'll be more demand for those vehicles. And so that's why I don't think that the prices will, will collapse by any measure. But I do expect them to come down somewhat over the next few months. Now, uh, the trucking protests are closing some of the border crossings, and as 
We know the auto business uh, relies on just-in-time supplies between Canada and the U.S. to ship freely. Could that affect car prices or supplies of new vehicles? Well, we're, right now the, the issue is that a few truckers are blocking the international bridges. And, uh, yeah, that's, that has already caused some supply issues. Um, I don't know how long they will continue uh, to block bridges like that. Uh, yeah, that this is kind of um, unpredictable how this will turn out. Eventually, you know, the authorities will move in and, and, and clear those bridges. Uh, but for right now, we've already seen uh, the first disruptions uh, on that, uh, I don't expect this to be a long-term issue. The chip shortage is a long-term issue. That yeah, this this situation with the bridges getting blocked is uh, is I think uh, is a matter of days, not uh, years, as with the semiconductors. Mm-hmm. Are automakers going to be able to get through the chip shortage this year? And uh, if they do, will they be able to build enough cars to meet demand? Well, the chip shortage turns out to be one of the most intractable things out there. And, and uh, a year ago, you know, we already had it, and there was already uh, shutting down plants because of it. And um, and they said, well, it'd be it'll be over with uh, later in that that year, so that's 2021. You know, and we should be done with it in the fall of 2001 and uh, 2021, and in the in, and towards the end of 2021. And then we got there, and it, it's going to be a few months more, maybe in 2022. And and uh, now, you know, it, it might drag into 2023. The thing is that parts of it are getting better. So there there is some improvement, but it continues to dog the industry. And and they're really desperate to buy these chips, so the whole purchasing uh, uh, strategies have changed and and bias, a lot of them are component makers. They're not actually the automakers, but they're component makers that make components for the automakers. Uh, you know, they're, they're trying to lock in supply by, by, uh, uh, you know, offering all kinds of special, uh, uh, terms and, and, or agreeing to special terms that the chip manufacturers are requiring now. And, and so this whole thing has changed. Everybody's just struggling to get some chips and, the supply is coming up. I mean, chip, chips are being manufactured in record numbers and being sold in record numbers, but there is a huge amount of demand, uh, not just from automakers, but from uh, consumer electronics, uh, you know, the, the, the smartphones, the laptops, the, the equipment you need around the house for your, for your office, and, all, and, and companies, you know, everybody has upgraded their their uh, point of sale technology, and we just went skiing, and and it used to be manual before. Now everything is electronic. I mean, you stick your credit card in to to buy a, a a pass for the day, and you don't even have to interact with anybody anymore. And 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 this is all expensive equipment that requires a lot of chips. And and companies have gone on a buying binge to to update these technologies, and that's still going on. So there's a huge amount of demand for these chips, and the supply chains just just aren't ready for that. And automakers got uh, pushed further down in the queue because you know they're 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 making uh, you know a few cars, and then uh, cell phone makers are making cell phones, and uh, so it, it they're not the top priority for the chip manufacturers. So this is just a really tangled up situation of excess demand and. And lots of supply, but not enough supply to to meet that demand. And uh, you know, and, and we we keep hearing automakers talking about more uh, plant closures. So uh, Toyota just came out with another uh, announcement um, a couple of days ago that it will close uh, some plants temporarily because it's going to run out of chips and it's going to to uh, reduce its production plants by half a million vehicles. So that's globally, you know, the Toyota is selling about 11 million vehicles a year, so that's half a million of them uh, are not going to get produced this year. And, you know, Ford still has issues and GM still has issues and Tesla has grabbed about it. And and so this is this is dragging on and, and nobody really knows uh, how this, when this will be finally resolved. Now, the, the investments are making in, in new chip plants, and there's 
hundreds of billions of dollars are now getting invested into semiconductor plants. You know, that doesn't come online this year. This is for later. You know, this is 2023 and further down the road. So for 2022, you know, the investments that they made in prior years are coming online, but, but not the, the plants that they're building now. And, uh, so, you know, I, I think automakers are going to improve production this year over last year. So this looks like this is happening, but they're still not able to produce uh, what they would have done in, in normal times. And uh, now there's also such a huge backlog of new vehicles, you know, that the order banks are full. Everybody wants to buy something, has ordered, you know, they're waiting for months to get the vehicles. So... For automakers to really catch up, they need to produce more than they used to produce. And uh, that's not in the cards at all in 2022. And that may come in 2023 or later. In 2022, they're still trying to catch up, and they won't make it. You know, they, they'll still lag behind, but the, but the situation will improve, uh, but not enough uh, to catch up. Is the bond market reacting to inflation? <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, Today is Thursday. We just, uh, as we're recording this, we're, we just get our CPI numbers in, in the United States. And, uh, so CPI, uh, it was just a headbanger number in, in 7.5%. And, and it's a core CPI jumped by 6%, uh, meaning without food and energy. Uh, services inflation jumped by 4.6%, so it's spreading into services. So this is now a huge, big problem uh, that has nothing to do anymore with supply chains now. It's, it's all about inflation having taken off. It's an inflation spiral. Wages are surging. So now we've got the, uh, the, 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 that kind of uh, wage spiral and inflation spiral going on. Um, we still got all kinds of stimulus going on. We've got the Fed still on the gas. Uh, with, uh, repressing interest rates to near zero and, and still buying assets. And, um, you know, so they're, they're throwing fuel on this fire and the bond market, uh, today reacted strongly to it. The, uh, 10 year yield today, <laughs> which, you know, it, it should have been much higher, but it, 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 uh, spiked through 2%. So, I mean, it was, uh, uh, it, it, it more than doubled in, in the fairly short period of time. Yeah, you know, the 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 two year yield jump further. Uh, there is some real reckoning now in the bond market uh, that um, the Fed is going to have to uh, crack down on this, or else it's going to be a major fiasco. Uh, the rate expect the rate hike expectations. So in in the in the futures market. Um, they have now jumped to uh, a 50 basis point hike in on March 16th. Uh, you know that that would still you, you're talking about a uh, policy rate that will be then between uh, 50 between half a percent and uh, and three quarters of a percent for the policy rate when inflation is is ten times as high as seven and a half percent. Yeah, so it would require something like 15. 50 basis points hikes to even catch up with inflation. And so the bond market is in for a world of hurt here. Uh, rising uh, interest rates uh, are are very tough on the holders of current bonds. Of course, buyers of future bonds are getting a better deal. They're getting higher interest rates. So it's very good for, for buyers of bonds in the future, but it is a very nasty deal uh, for uh, the current bondholders and they're reacting to it. I mean, we've seen it today, despite the Fed still pushing down on interest rates. You know, the, with a ten percent, with a ten-year yield above two percent, uh, that's that's a fairly big move. Are consumers burying themselves deeper and deeper in debt? Yes, they are. And uh, the uh, except for credit cards, uh, that the major consumer uh, credit. Categories that we have, so mortgages, uh, auto loans, and and um, uh, student loans, and then other debt uh, like like uh, yeah yeah. So these these three categories have all jumped to records. Uh, credit cards have not. So consumers have tied down the credit cards during the crisis with all the free money they got, and so they're rising, but they're below where they used to be in, in 2019. Now the thing is here that uh 
because of the forbearance programs during the pandemic that the government has put in place that allowed all past due mortgages to be rolled into forbearance programs to where they're no longer past due. And, and, and then the home price surge created a situation where, where there essentially no more past due mortgages. You know, they, they just all disappeared and, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the foreclosure rates are at record lows. The, uh, the delinquency rates of mortgages are at record lows and, and part, mostly because he, the, the stimulus money has flown in and because of the, uh, uh, um, the foreclosure bans and the forbearance programs. The same thing happened in in credit cards. Uh, consumers have used some of the money they got uh, to to, to uh, pay off the arrears that they had on the credit card. So the delinquency rates on credit cards have dropped. The fresh delinquency rates on credit cards have dropped to record lows. Uh, the same with student loans. All student loans were automatically enrolled in in forbearance programs, so nobody's passed to anything anymore. And uh, now all student loans essentially are current, even though nobody's made any payments on them in, in nearly two years. And uh, and and so uh, this creates this kind of illusion or uh, you know, there are no more delinquencies uh, in the United States. The bankruptcies have dropped to record lows. Uh, third-party collections have dropped to record lows. I mean, it, when you look at it, and I just did this, this big article on my site with dozens of charts, you know, it, it looks like the consumer is in the most fantastic financial health ever. And, um, and you yeah, know, using these programs and using these trillions of dollars that were handed out to uh, to correct delinquencies and then using programs to get delinquent um, uh, mortgages, uh, off the list of delinquencies, and then also the booming house prices allowed uh, people to either sell their home and pay off the mortgage and have some cash left over, or or uh, make a new deal with the lender. So yeah, despite all that that record barn that is now going on, uh, these programs that we've had had the effect of curing all the delinquencies. <laughs> you know, they're gone. And, uh, you know, it will take a while for, for even to get back to normal. I mean, if, if you get a good recession now, a big one, you know, it, it will go back to normal, but it, it, it will take a long time, you know, because people have really gotten all the stuff taken care of. And, uh, so it, it's a very bizarre situation, you know, and there's a lot of bankruptcy lawyers out there griping, you know, they're going out of business. <laughs> they, yeah, they ran out of clients because nobody's filing for bankruptcy anymore, hardly. Hmm. <laughs> that is very ironic, the bankruptcy forbearance people going bankrupt. <laughs> What's the latest on real estate? So we're at a uh, inflection point, I think. Um, the mortgage rates are going up, so it's, uh, our benchmark 30-year fixed rate uh, mortgage rate is now approaching 4%. And uh, when it gets a little over four percent, there will be a lot of buyers at current prices that can't afford to buy anymore, and they're just going to to hang in there. And uh, you'll see the volume go down. And we've seen a little bit of that already in some of the condos that we have in San Francisco and in other places. But uh, then, in addition, there's the stock market issue. That, uh, a lot of the hottest housing markets are very dependent on stock market gains and crypto gains. And uh, those have now run into hot water, into rough waters. So we've, for San Francisco, you know, I looked at a few years ago, I looked at the relationship between the NASDAQ and home prices. And with about a six-month lag, you know, home prices follow the NASDAQ. And so if you have a long enough a sell-off in the NASDAQ, it will drag down home prices. And, um, you know, this is, uh, yeah, the, the Fed is raising interest rates. Interest rates will go up. This this cannot persist. And, and some mortgage rates will go up and asset prices will go down. And, you know, this is the inflection point in real estate. And, and so it will take real estate is slow in reacting. It will take it will take many months for this to show up in, in the overall numbers. Uh we may see some of it in the underlying dynamics. There's a lot of people that have multiple homes uh that are vacant, you know, they they are going to eventually put those on the market when prices stop rising so that supply will come online. Well we've been through this before, we kind of know the pattern. So um yeah, the numbers won't show this for 
for several for quite a few more months. I, I would say six months, you know, before we see really the uh, the, the the impact of all of this. But uh, yeah, there 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 is an inflection point now, and in the mechanics of this real estate bubble that we've had, and uh, what has driven prices up is no longer driving driving up the prices. So you know the. <laughs> It, it has to change now. You know, the, the, the reality has changed, and so the housing market will eventually react to that. Wolf, anything else we should be keeping a close eye on right now? Well, keep a close eye on my website, wolfstreet.com, uh, where we discuss all these things. Uh, you know, the biggie right now is inflation and the central bank's reaction to inflation so uh, and, and the impact of those uh, uh policies on the bond market and the stock market and we're we're um, covering all this on my website and yeah this is, these are very unsettled times so this is it's going to be a little rough here how do people sign up for wolf street just go to wolfstreet.com everything is free and there's you don't need to sign up you can get on the email list it's also free but uh, you can just show up at wolfstreet.com well thank you so much for being on this week in money thank you jim my guest has been Wolf Richter, publisher of WolfStreet.com. He was speaking to us from San Francisco. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, John Rubino, and Wolf Richter. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for our guests or the show, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update from American Manganese President Larry Ray. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Welcome back to the show, Larry. Well, thank you, Jim. Larry, I know you have a pilot plant in the works. Uh, what's happening with it? Well, it's uh, more than a pilot plant. It's a, it's a demonstration plant. Uh, there's a higher throughput and a continuous operation. It's... Uh, the work is going along fine on that. I haven't uh, updated anybody yet because I'd like to send some pictures. Once it starts to uh, come together, besides uh, being spaced out on the floor, because it looks just looks like a bunch of tanks and uh, pumps and uh, filters and all kinds of different things the, uh, that uh, is hard to assemble, you know, it's hard to uh, get the message across. We're uh, we're still shooting for uh, having it uh, all put together to be tested uh, by in uh, in February here, and uh, that'll be the water test to start with to make sure there's no leaks, and then we'll start putting material through. Now the uh, the other thing that keeps uh, coming up every once in a while is how is the D DLA application. Well, that is uh, in my opinion has gone sad sideways and. Uh, I couldn't tell you uh, what the results are going to be. <clears throat> I can tell you that our first uh, uh, attempt to get the DLA involved in the uh, Wendon stockpile was almost uh, eight or nine years ago, and uh, so it took that long. So uh, this is not surprising to me. So uh, you know, if, uh, if we're going to move ahead, we'll be letting the letting the world know. If we're not, we'll be letting the world know. And uh, but just talking about other things that we have going, the uh, our high-grade gold copper property up at the Rocher de Boule is uh, we're trying to get the permits so we can get in there drilling this summer, and uh, so that's moving along fairly well. Uh, we've certainly got uh, the major house supporting it. Uh, so uh, we we would like to uh, push that through the uh, through the uh, the process and get the uh, permits before summer, and uh, so we're working away on that. 
And uh, if you're following the market, you'll see that uh, gold uh, took a $35 jump today, which is uh, extraordinary for it. It may be a breakout, and uh, and that's all to do with inflation. So uh, it's nice to have a gold asset in the company. And uh, certainly uh, an upcoming drill program and some great targets that, uh, you know, could catapult us into uh, – a uh, you know a more rounded out company with different uh, sources of revenue on the horizon. So who knows? I mean, it's uh, I like the property. I always have, and uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, ready to be drilled. We've done the work that uh, is required. Uh, we've got some great anomalies to shoot for, and we've got some uh, great targets uh, based on the uh, high grade mining operation. That occurred, God, I guess it would be 50 to 70 years ago. And, uh, so that's, uh, that's looking good, Jim. Uh, I think that, uh, the timing is perfect on that. So if we can get the permits and get in there and get drilling, uh, we can, uh, we hope to do that, uh, in the last year. But, uh, permits, uh, you know, especially with, uh, First Nations and everything else, uh, approving of it. Uh, takes time, so uh, it's uh, we're working steadily on it, and uh, we have an expert uh, trying to get the permits done, uh, John Bellhumer, and uh, so and he's worked for me in the past up on the uh, up on our uh, molybdenum project, and then our manganese project, and then our our uh, Rocher de Boule projects. So we're hoping to get that going. And uh, we also have uh, uh, the fact that uh, lithium is now carrying the profitability for iron phosphate batteries. I want you to think about that um, because the lithium value is uh, up four times in, in this year, over the last year, and uh, it's uh, setting the world on fire. And uh, it moved the iron phosphate into a profitable category just based on the lithium alone. But you wouldn't base an operation uh, on that because you never know uh, when lithium may come back down to earth. And uh, you don't want to be just stuck with a low-priced iron phosphate. So uh, just, to, just to let everybody know that we're looking at that, uh, We'll be doing testing on that uh, some someplace in the future, and uh, we, you know, come up with some results that uh, uh, will show us exactly, uh, you know, where we push the pen on the paper, and how it looks uh, to be a profitable situation. But you can't just go on uh, on uh, when you have multi elements. You can't just go on the one element. Um, right now, lithium's in short short supply. And uh, it'll carry the ball for maybe two two years, maybe three. And uh, but you know, by the time you uh, do a feasibility study on that, uh, it, the whole dynamics may change. So you got to be very careful. Uh, we like the idea that we are recycling. Uh, uh, have a process for recycling, and the demonstration plant will prove out what we can do. And I can tell you there's a lot of NDA companies that are looking and waiting for that result. And, uh, you know, we've had some great write-ups in the last month on uh, on our process, and our re- which is recyclable. The name's being changed, as everybody knows, uh, at the uh, AGM that's coming up in June. So, you know, we're just pushing ahead. Our treasury is still solid. And... Uh, you know, even though we uh, see that, you know, costs are going up, um, you know, which is uh, inflation. I mean, uh, you, you're going to have that. It's just unavoidable. And um, certainly uh, the big beneficiary of inflation is uh, the precious metals. So uh, and I think that the uh, metals for uh, lithium-ion batteries, which is a fantastic growing industry, is, uh, you know, reaching a point where uh, people will start to recognize that maybe they want to own a piece of a company that's involved in that EV revolution and certainly recycling, which is uh, 
got a few companies, well, quite quite a few companies out there that are talking about it, but uh, a lot of them don't have patents, and we do have patents, and that uh, you know puts a protective moat around our uh, project. So uh, yeah, we've uh, got a couple pending, and uh, we're waiting to hear back on a couple of more, and uh, we'll be through those patent applications. So. Uh, it's great. It's uh, you know, it's an exciting uh, arena that we're in right now, and uh, I'm just uh, sorry that I was uh, caught uh, with pneumonia and uh, COVID uh, at the same time, and uh, it certainly slowed me down personally, but it didn't slow down the advancement of the company because we got some good people in here. So uh, let's. Uh, move along here and talk about uh, the markets in general. As you see, the markets can go up uh, fantastically and they can go down fantastically. Everybody's talking about a big crash, but they've been talking about that for 10 years. And uh, I can see corrections, but I don't see a big crash. I think that certain elements of the market will carry it along. And uh, I think we're involved in that uh, in that area, so uh, it's a uh, it's a good hedge. It's a good way to, uh, as you can see, the stock is holding fairly steady in the 80s. And uh, if we put a press release out, we're guaranteed to go down. But uh, you know, I won't even well I'll say it. That's the predators uh, operating that day, or if the market goes up. Uh, the general overall market, uh, they'll try to take us down. And, uh, you know, which is, uh, I think it's so obvious out there that even the uh, newest shareholders can see that uh, somebody's doing some manipulation out there. So, uh, and it's, uh, you know, let's uh, look at the run-ups in the stocks. They're usually when the, uh, the uh, Reddit group or one of those groups uh, mail some company that, uh, has got a lot of shorts against it and uh, t- decided to take it for a long run. And, uh, and I'm thinking that that's not too far away. So uh, anyway, uh, Jim, uh, I went through this a lot faster than I thought I would. But, uh, you know, you got to like the fact that now uh, lithium's carrying the weight for uh, iron phosphate lithium buying batteries. And that uh, certainly... Uh, you know, put some new dynamic, dynamics on it as it's becoming popular with some of the uh, battery manufacturers. And, uh, you know, I think we got our foot in that uh, piece of pie, too. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been a uh, up-and-down week, and uh, certainly uh, um, we're hoping to have, uh, I think I said this in the last podcast, having something out on our demonstration plant, People like to see us putting out press releases, uh, and uh, certainly the demonstration plant will uh, generate some press releases. So uh, that's uh, that's about it for now, Jim. I wish uh, you, yourself a very uh, great weekend, and I wish our investors a great weekend. Larry, if someone was new to American Manganese, how would you describe the company? It's a critical metals company that first got involved in technology with manganese back in 2008 because the U.S. has a lot of, or certainly in the Tillery Peak area, they have billions and billions of pounds of uh, manganese that are to be exploited, but they're t- 2 to 3 percent. And we developed a, a technology that allowed us to, uh, to actually take that 2 to 3 percent and turn it into a uh, electrolytic manganese metal or dioxide for the batteries that will uh, uh, move it forward. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, I think the U.S. really needs this, uh, so I'm hoping they get behind us and uh, keep pushing along And uh, because they're going to need it. You know, you can't make steel without it, and you can't make steel, the world stops. So, uh that's uh, now we've turned that into a technology, the technology for recycling batteries, which we hold several patents around the world, and uh, that uh, is uh, our major focus, and always has been the major focus in this company has been on the recycling of lithium-ion batteries, 
and uh, everything else, is, uh, as far as we can, are concerned at this point, is minor. But uh, it's uh, it's the uh, lithium-ion batteries that everybody should be focused on because that's where we exactly want them to, you know, put their attention. And uh, we're also you can find out anything there is to know about us. Uh, we had a write-up recently by somebody that went through our site. And uh, it was very concise on uh, what we'd accomplished and everything else and our patents and everything else and peer reviews and gee whiz, I mean, what more do people want? Um, that uh, tells you that uh, we do have a process that works and uh, I'm not seeing anybody else that's even close on that. But, uh, you know, it's uh, different to say they're going to recycle batteries without any uh, background noise or background information on the R&D that they were doing. So it's, uh, you know, I think they have to be using different mythologies of chemicals than we are because uh, we have that area patented. So uh, you can uh, find this out at AmericanManganeseInc.com, which is our website. Everything's on there. And uh, we try to be transparent about these things. The um, other thing is that we... Uh, you know, we've, uh, we, well, actually, we trade on the uh, Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol AMY, and we trade in the QB board under the symbol AMYZF, and we trade on the uh, Frankfurt Exchange under the symbol 2AM, and uh, you can reach us at 778-574-4444, uh, or you could email me at L-R-E-A-U-G-H at A-M-Y-M-N dot com. Larry, thank you so much for the update and enjoy Valentine's Day. Okay, thank you, Jim. My guest has been Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on February 11th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.